Hello everyone, I am Professor Paul Carrier and what I'd like to do now is to provide some background information with regard to the materials assigned for week 9 of Contracts 1. Okay, so let me begin by stating that we just finished breach. We had seven weeks of formation, one quick but important week on breach, and we will be spending the next four weeks on damages, also kind of, not kind of, but sometimes known as remedies. Remedies, damages, those terms are often used interchangeably. Be careful, but understand that when you see those two words, it's what we're covering now. It's what follows a breach of a formed contract. With regard to damages, there are four main areas that we will be covering in each of the next four weeks. And so it's good to get your mind around the very major damages topics that we cover because it'll help you when you analyze a problem to understand which area you should be addressing, common law, etc., if you know what these categories are, if you have a clear picture of what these categories are. The first one is the common law type. And you'll see things like expectation damages, restitution damages, reliance damages, this concept of compensatory damages. So that's what we'll be covering in this week nine. Next, we will cover certain requirements or limitations on damages, and that will be in week 10. For example, what if a party doesn't know that in case of breach, the other non-breaching party will suffer a kind of damage? If a, a damage is unknown, why should the party who breached be responsible for it? What if you can't measure the damage? Somebody alleges it's worth a million dollars, but it could be worth a million, could be worth 50. If it's uncertain, we may not be able to award that kind of damage. So there are certain requirements before particularly the special damages, which we learn about in week nine, uh, are in fact awardable. We will cover in uh, nine, ten, uh, week 11 the uh, damages provisions specific to the Uniform Commercial Code or a state's adoption of same those Article II issues involving sale of goods. And you have a buyer who may be a breacher or a non-breacher. You have a seller who may be a breacher or a non-breacher. And there are some special rules, some special factual scenarios that come up often. For example, when you can't get a supply of something you need and you buy an alternative supply, we call that cover, covering what you need based on the supplier's breach. And so there are awards, there are damages, there are provisions in Article 2 uh, and its adoption within state law that have uh, special concepts, special terms, not all that different than the damages we learn about in Class 9, but some are very factually specific, and so uh, we'll spend at least well a one full week on that. Finally, in Week 12, we have a special chapter on equitable remedies. Everything I mentioned before, uh, well, there's some with sale of goods, uh, week 11, where there's some equitable remedies as well. But most of what I've already mentioned, what we cover for the first three weeks from now, will be uh, general damages, special damages, but they will be legal damages. They are awardable in money, okay? There is a subset, a special category of equitable remedy and with equitable remedy, a court can, for example, order another party to comply. Uh, and so that is extreme, and that's why it falls under the doctrine of equity. Also, perhaps there is no real contract. It really failed. But something would be so unfair that a court is going to find a way anyway of compensating one of the parties. And that would be uh, one of the uh, subcategories of equitable remedy is the quasi-contractual remedy. And the idea is there was no real contract, but somebody did the work already, and since the other party has benefit from the work, at least he or she should pay the value of that remedy. So those are the four weeks of, of damages that we're going to cover, followed by week 13 of statute of frauds, which is actually a defense, and we cover defenses significantly at the end of contracts too. But it was just the right place, and I'll explain why later, why this is a good place to cover at least one of the defenses in Contracts 1, when most of its brethren or sestren will be in Contracts 2. Now, turning to today's material. First and foremost, make sure that you always understand, and if you have a bar exam or a contracts exam, you uh, 
express the fact that the goal is to put a non-breaching party in the position that he or she would have been in had the contract been fully completed. It's not before the contract, not after the contract, well, after the contract. Had the contract been completed, what would the person have benefited in that regard? Subject, of course, to some of the limitations that we learn about next week. Okay? Uh, when we talk about getting them what they deserve if the contract was fully performed, we don't mean windfall profit. They don't get more than they would have gotten had the contract been fully performed. So that's one issue. Another thing, contract law does not like penalties or punitive damages. If there's a tort, if there's a crime, that's different. But in contract law, you're supposed to get what you would have gotten had the contract been fully performed. Anything above that, by way of, for example, punitive damages, would have to be by some other cause of action, which you can argue in conjunction with. For example, he breached the contract, it cost me $300,000. He also committed a tort at the same time, so he owes me another $800,000 in punitive damages. So long as you separately plead and prove the torts damages alongside the contract ones, you can get them both. But understand that a court's not going to like a punitive damages claim under a purely contractual theory. There has to be some other theory, torts or some public policy, that would allow for damages above and beyond that necessary to compensate a person as if the contract had been fully performed. Okay, uh, we will cover the first of the general damages is, um, well, the first damage component is restitution. And the idea behind that is if a non-breaching party and off the record, even sometimes a breaching party, has turned over something of value that the other party's holding and the contract fails or something goes wrong, maybe we can't figure out with certainty what the damages are next week. Uh, maybe there's some other problem with granting ordinary damages, but at least could the first party get that thing back? Example, there's a construction contract where someone's going to build a porch. So there's contractor or constructor and homeowner. Contractor takes all the paving bricks for the porch and puts them on site. Something goes wrong and for some reason other forms of damage are not appropriate. Doesn't the contractor or the constructor at least have the right to get the bricks back? If there's no other remedy, can he or she or it at least get the bricks back? Does the homeowner deserve those bricks? Probably not. That would be a good example of um, uh, reliance, forgive me, restitution damage. Be very careful, like I just was not. Restitution is to get back something that the other party is holding and doesn't deserve. It's often a default. When there's no other good remedy, others are usually better, but for some reason they just might not be awardable. Well, then restitution might be the only thing. Another good example of restitution is a deposit, perhaps a refundable deposit. At least you get that back if you can't get anything else. Okay? Uh, reliance damage. Uh, reliance is basically the idea that if you spend money believing that a contract is going to be performed, then if that was a reasonable expectation, you should be compensated for that as well as uh, for any other form of breach. Let's say that you're buying widgets and you hire a special truck to buy the widgets. And when you hire the truck, you rent the truck and you can't get your money back or you can't get your deposit back. Did you not rent that truck in reliance on getting the widgets? Okay, and if the widgets don't come through, you not only lose the widgets and possibly lost profits or lost value if you made a really good deal, but you also lost the rental value or at least the deposit on rental for the truck. And that was not your fault, it was the other party's fault. So restitution is also a, a part of the mix or a possible part of the mix. One of the real problems is sometimes you might get restitution, you might get reliance but you won't get the general damages, the expectation damages I'm going to talk about in a minute. And so, depending on the facts, and this is somewhat complicated, you may or may not be able to mix and match all of these three. Sometimes you'll get two of them, sometimes you'll get only one, and in class, hopefully, we can make that a little bit more clear. Um, expectation damages. That's what you get ordinarily, things that naturally flow from a breach. And there are general ones which truly naturally flow. For example, uh, if you lose a really good deal, they're going to sell you widgets at $1,000 cheaper than ordinary. 
and you don't get those widgets. You go out and buy a new source and it's $1,000 extra. That's your damage. The loss in good price, special price, is your expectation damage, which generally flows. Uh, generally naturally flows. There are also special damages that are a little bit more um, tenuous. They're, it's not like they're not um, awardable. It's not that they, they're not incurred. It's just that sometimes they're not as awardable. Let me give a quick example. Well, let me get to an example a little bit later. Let's go with a general damage. Uh, you hire a painter paint for $3,000. Painter doesn't do the job. You hire a new painter for $4,000. You had to pay an extra $1,000 because of the painter's breach. It's clear. You have a loss of $4,000. I'm sorry, a loss of $1,000. $4,000 minus 3000 is $1,000. And so if the painter was at, in breach, the homeowner or the order of the service should be able to collect $1,000, which is the amount that it cost extra to get another painter to do the work. Okay? Um, second example, uh, general damages could be uh, something like a loss in value, as promised versus as delivered. What if somebody delivers you a big batch of widgets? And the widgets are not quite perfect. They're close. But you have to fix something before you put them into your other product. That extra time, that extra effort to fix, maybe even the uh, performance is just a little bit less precise, that's a damage. And so you might be, but you might need those widgets. You can't find another source. So if you still take those widgets, you could get the price differential, price as promised to you versus the price as delivered. There's also a very special thing you'll learn in this week with regard to property value, like construction contracts on real property, and you might get the diminution in value of the property as promised versus as delivered, rather than the cost to fix whatever that problem was. Uh, keep that one in mind because that is a highly testable example, and it would fit under a general damage. Let me give you an example of a special damage. What if you are buying widgets and you put widgets into your blenders? And then when you sell your blenders to in a foreign country, you make $500,000 profit on your blenders. If you don't get these widgets in time, you can't get your blenders in time to the buyer in another country. So losing the widgets without being able to cover it in time to fix the problem means that you lose a, a, a third party, another contract with another party, and you lose to the, to the tune of $500,000 loss. Should you be able to collect the lost profit on that sale, which happened, which occurred because of the, the problem with delivery of the widgets? And then that's one where we look next week, we look at the requirements or limitations on damage, particularly with regard to special damage. It has, they have to be certain enough. They have to be foreseeable. The other party has to kind of know that you're going to make that loss if, it, it, if they do not perform on time. So there's certainty, there's foreseeability, uh, and there's one more element I'll talk about in just a little bit. Sorry, someone's at my door. Um, okay. Well, so now, uh, again, we just covered common law type damages. We've got expectation ones, general special, reliance, restitution. And sometimes you get some of those. Sometimes you'll only get one of those. In fact, let me give you an example. Let's say you, you put a deposit down of $100. And then you rent a truck for $200. You've got $300 in expectation that the other side is going to perform. What if the other side doesn't perform and the profit you would have made on the deal is $1,000? Understand, if you didn't pay the $100 for the deposit and you didn't pay the $200 for the rental truck, you wouldn't have gotten that deal anyway and you never would have gotten the $1,000 profit. So if the court just gives you $1,000 as your loss, you don't also get the restitution and reliance of $300. That's 100 plus 200. Because you would have lost that either way. That's a wash. You would have lost it. So you can't get your expectation lost profit and restitution and reliance. Your lost profit would have encompassed all of your damage.